Michelin in France for the last five years, and uh, I really do not appreciate them there. But one of the things that I miss the most is Kiadina. I don't know if you are doing Kiadina. I was recently introduced to you from the Alexander. Okay, we're live now. Iranian restaurant and they are Kinan. And there was a oh It's a few things. It's a few things. But actually, thank you for giving me that because that gives me an easy way to explain oh, some of our breads and stuff. The Italian. So I. <laughs> I went back I'm 
We're good. I'm just trying to get some people on. <laughs> Your primary colors are being reflected quite well. The purple is a good look. I describe this look as drawn by children. <laughs> <laughs> it's good though. It's good though. But well, we're kind of ready to start. I don't know what's happening. I've been told that I can participate. It's just a conversation where everybody sits down there and has a conversation, run by dominance, and debate about what's happening in food. Food? Don't know anything about that. Well, I don't think I've made a bunch of food. Yeah. Just, you know, just, mm. <laughs> Thank 
Kobe brought them in that's still that happens to them. Are they? This kid, this kid. They're gonna get big. They're gonna get big. Uh, 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 as rabbits, if you understand what I mean. Yeah, 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 yeah. Nice puppy rabbit. Well, it'll be good food for them. In the past, it would have been common. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Today, it's last. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm liaising. There, there are a couple of people there. They're linking in. I think we give it. What time is it now? Who? Well, the. I, okay, I'll try and find his name. I think we should probably start soon. You heard me. I'll give him another minute. <laughs> I see the recitation. They Their British is pretty short. It's fading away day by day. And at the end of the day, they have a new And so people. I think that's the first Okay. Can you give me a high sign? Second. Give me a high sign. What I'll do in that case is I will shorten that intro a lot. I'll just talk about 20 seconds. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So everybody's sitting comfortably. As you know, this is just to lower expectations. This has been called the great debate. Um, rather more modestly, um, the uh, symposium as a whole is called Thought for Food. And uh, as you know, we've been thinking about food all day in lots of constructive ways um, about the good things. Um, particularly in the last presentation by Kameen Mohammadi, when she was talking about the effect that can have on a migrant um, and came out with a beautiful phrase, the most effective way to make someone who is far away feel at home is food. Um, we've also think, been thinking though about some of the more negative sides, evil indeed sides of food, um, reflecting on how it can prompt crime, it can cause fraud, it can lead to pollution, it can displace entire peoples, uh, pose health risks, and even lead to uh, slavery. And um, what I'd like to try and do is to pick out um, just a few of the themes that I think have emerged during the discussion today. Um, one of which I think is how to make people care about the issues surrounding food. Um, and the other, or another, being um, secure change in more um, tangible, more um, effective ways perhaps than influencing public opinion. And then finally, and that's really the, going to be the debate tomorrow, um, more about the effect that food can have on on climate change, though maybe we can talk talk about that at some point uh, this evening. What, what I'd like to do, though, is to start with that first issue about how to make people actually care about these issues. Um, and uh, we heard, for example, that nowadays, for example, in Italy, only 17% of household budgets are being spent on food. Um, so it's not perhaps surprising that people don't worry too much about the issues that may lie behind it and that lie there in the, um, the food chain. Um, any suggestions? Anybody like to start with that? Rick, I can see your... Preparing to intervene. It's a very complicated question uh, because I'm not sure that I believe any longer that it, though it used to be in my business of trying to make people um, care about certain things or change behavior. I worked for a long time in a field in Canada trying to work on uh, behavior change at a population scale and of course behind that was meant to be attitude change and so on. I, I think that, and yet, what, I, what I've seen is that sometimes we do change our behavior. So, for example, if I had a cigarette right now and lit it up in this room, everybody would think that I was, um, yeah, I was crazy for sure. Um, now, when you all would have got together to agree, I don't know, because if I'd done that 15 years ago, it would have been absolutely acceptable. So, there are um, periods 
and possibilities for large-scale transformation. They fascinate me. And smoking is a great example. The end of foot binding in China, which went on for at least a millennium, and probably over that time, at least a billion women had their feet bound, also ended in about the same period of time, um, about 15 years, it seems. It was a sort of scale for that transformation. Um, I think that um, that of those changes, though I'm not an economic person, I don't really think necessarily in those terms, I think they're market changes. I mean, there's so many attempts to change people understanding behavior with education and awareness campaigns. They're useful, but they are certainly not the only thing. One of the, if I can just ramble for one more second, one of the problems that we've got which is not just caring more about food, is that we are a consumer culture, not a production culture, which means that we, that the real rules of the, the, of the game are cheap. How do we get, and then behavior is determined by cheap. Go, walk into a Walmart um, or any of these big box stores, and you'll see that people, even without much money, are spending an enormous amount of their time and attention trying to figure out what they can buy cheap. And the people that control systems, the power that controls distribution systems, not attitude systems, but distribution systems, have figured out how to make things very cheap because we're a consumer culture and all beneficiaries. And we think that uh, benefit is being able to get things at the lowest price. So that's a, a non-answer, but a provocation for the discussion. Well, no, I think it actually leads on very nicely into another very striking remark that was made earlier on today by Michele um, when he said um, that what we need is a change from I, uh, from idealizing, as he put it, to idealizing, getting people to think about that, you know, when they buy food, uh, when they consume food, they're actually perhaps doing something that they don't intend um, and that that thing can be very bad, it can be very negative. Um, any other thoughts on the same subject? Yeah. I just wanted to mention your examples made me think of two other things that happened very quickly that didn't exist before. For example, normal within quotes people having tattoos before a guy with the tattoo was maybe a sailor or an inmate. And for example, men, men or both, or men uh, having beards. I had a beard from when I was 20 to 40 and got rid of it and was one of the few people with beards. Now everyone seems to have one or almost, even you. <laughs> um, aside from the fact that th this ties on to something else I was going to say, uh, I remember big companies reading spent millions of dollars in research in how to design supermarkets and uh, the packaging of products because that all has an effect. So if a product was placed somewhere, you would get it versus if it was placed somewhere else. Uh, the colors that are most effective, the fact that when you go to the supermarket, there are all those little things at the end. And for... For example, personally, the only way I can enter a supermarket, even though I know all this, and exit with exactly what I wanted to get, is not just have a list, but have the limited amount of money. If I have a credit card, you know, forget it, or a debit card, I'll just add stuff because there's, oh, wow, there's that, uh, you know, chance you get three for two or two for one or whatever and you always take advantage. So there are ways to either one could say manipulate or uh, convince or whatever we want to say people, and we need to study maybe those better in the same way that companies have for their own purposes. But one other thing I think would be very important is to improve in schools the teaching of history and geography, things about people, be and even in, for example, living in Italy, uh, the average Italian doesn't know how to pick an olive oil or a wine. That's something I guess you should teach in school so you know you would become equipped to do it. And I think education, uh, which also prevents people uh, believing, you know, propaganda and bullshit uh, that is always more and more frequently being used in politics, and then these techniques 
uh, that we've mentioned probably combined would would uh, maybe provide in part an answer. <clears throat> Thank you. I, I think the uh, most of us, at least, we we evaluate human behavior based on ourselves. Like, how do you react to the situation? That's the only real clue we have. So. When I see a picture of a child harvesting cocoa, it makes me cry. I feel anyone should see that picture and say, I will never contribute to that. But that's just not true. And so I think that, for me at least, I, I want to better understand and I'm open to all kinds of uh, suggestions on how do we make someone who does, n or let's even say they do feel bad looking at the picture, but they're not willing to do one little thing to help that child. I, I don't know the answer. I'm suggesting that's the question of how do you communicate in such a way that someone could see that picture and say, that's it, I'll never buy Nestle again or I will never buy Nestle again until I know for sure that they've done something about it. And it's not health that's at stake, uh, maybe mental health, if we could figure out a way to embarrass people. I think uh, Charlotte said earlier that you can so quickly destroy the evidence. You could eat a Nestle bar and no one saw you do it, but <laughs> you, you want to make sure that maybe that person feels bad about that. But we need a motivator and I'm not quite sure what that is. <clears throat> no, uh, I think that there is not n no strategy on the short term that can work. Uh, unfortunately, Let's go on. Uh, just just to be <laughs> pessimistic before dinner, uh, I think that only a long term strategy. School has, has already been quoted, uh, but in general, to give back value to food takes a long term strategy, because if we don't give back value to food, uh, we are not ready and I'm not willing to pay more for it and we are not ready to pretend and to ask for uh, a making of food that is respectful to people. Um, we have three levels that, that now are in descending order moving us. Health and this is moving us. Uh, if they tell us don't donate some nutrients or some compounds we are pretty uh, immediately responding to that. Second uh, the pollution element, and we are almost ready to respond, but if it's very good, you know, it's so good that even if it pollutes to produce it, I can skip anything. Third, the, the, the respect for human rights and social dignity. And this is absolutely not moving the mass. Absolutely. I totally agree with what, with, with what Terry has just said. I mean, we assume that for the fact that the when we see a, a child used to used actually to uh, pick, so, uh, everybody should be uh, complaining about that, and, and it's not like and it, it's not like, or uh, maybe it's never been. So we definitely need to raise uh, a, a new kind of in order to with the problem we can that again just to end move to a country like for instance don't buy the bars of that company because they are plundering the children uh, in, in Cote d'Ivoire it makes a change for a while okay it's like to throw a big mass into a river the flow will move for a moment but after the after the rock in a couple of meters everything is again like it was before we need a long term change and it takes a new literacy for people that have lost any uh, dimension of dignity and value behind food were definitely not lost. Good, good. Uh, I think new literacy campaigns, what educating people is all not bad professions of the religion we all believe in, which is that good food is good, and that's that's our sacred story. But you know, the thing we have to realize is that the dominant industries have found 
an incredibly efficient and inexpensive way to deliver cheap calories to people who need those things. And um, when they're making their choices, they're not the same choices that we're making because we have much more latitude. And this has gone on forever. I mean, fascinating to read George Orwell and I think the road to Wigan Pier and all of the attempts to correct the, you know, the middle class attempts to correct the middle, let's call it middle moralizing classes attempt to correct the behaviors of those that they don't agree with. I'm guilty of this because I worked on anti-smoking and anti-drug campaigns, but cigarettes, drugs mean things to people that they don't mean to us. What we need to do is to figure out great, um, I mean, I think ultimately there will be deep paradigmatic changes that will change our religion and our value from the religion of cheap to the religion of dignity and well-being. I think that's important and therefore knowing what we want is really important. But in the meantime, we need to figure out efficiencies so that we can beat dominant systems. It doesn't mean we need to make things cheaper, but we need to get, we, we need to, the hard work of getting distribution channels that work and, and getting control of distribution channels that now only the most powerful industrial actors can control. Uh, and I think that, that creating different alternatives at the choice point rather than the moral education of human beings whose, um, whose decision quanta are very different from us is probably will ultimately be a much more effective approach. Um, I wanted to pick up on uh, something that Makeda was saying about education and, and young people because I feel that in the discussions we've been having today and even last evening, uh, we haven't been referencing young people at all and that's kind of curious because if you think about it in the you know recent times it's been big globally that everyone is realizing with the school uh, school students strike for climate change uh, also some uh, research that's been done in terms of how uh, through campaigning, often it's the children or the young people who are able to uh, take moral stands, to make decisions, to push for things and nudge their parents in certain directions, even in terms of not buying certain foods, if you wish. Um, and so I think you know, that's something that we need to be tapping into and uh, it probably goes beyond the more the formal sort of sense of education through education systems though that's important um, because we know that children today live in a world they live in a global world and the flow of information around that's really erratic and viral and and something that we don't fully understand or even certainly don't have control over um, to just one point there that I think we need to follow up on. And the other thing was to the point about cheap and uh, food, because where I work, which is the, the UN World Food Programme, we are looking at the, you know, the people who are really the, uh, the hardest to reach and the poorest and the least advantaged in across, you know, societies around the globe. And there was an interesting bit of research that was done uh, which uh, started off being called a plate of food um, and then we thought that when it was actually being presented that sounded a little uh, kind of not very convincing and um, so it became counting the beans and the counting the beans index and what it essentially did was look at what is the cost of a, a simple meal what is the cost of sort of a bean soup something that gives you you know, a hearty meal with enough calories and some, you know, vitamins and minerals in there as well. And look at what the cost of that was relative to economies around the globe. And you'd be surprised to, or perhaps not surprised, to find that, you know, whereas here in Italy, uh, people seem to be only spending 17% of their you know, household budget on uh, food in many countries, and particularly if you're talking groups like smallholder farmers in uh, air, rural areas, they will be spending between 60 and 80 percent of their daily income on food. But this plate of food index, um, uh, the most, the, the first year that it was done, the, the counting the beans, it turned out that actually 
if you weigh it all up in South Sudan, what it would cost you because of the economy, because of the dysfunctionality of, of everything there, it would cost you something like uh, for, uh, $200 for this plate of food, whereas in New York, it would cost you, you know, a dollar fifty. Um, so there's a lot of considerations there about uh, what in each of our cultures, what cheap means, what is affordable, um, and uh, how economies, you spoke to capital flows and capital movements, um, how economies constrict uh, and or permit people to be able to feed their families better. I mean, just one area where I think um, I'll come to you now. So I don't know whether anybody got any thoughts on this, but you mentioned young people. Um, certainly in Italy, they are embracing a vegan diet very rapidly um, because of fears about climate change. There's an overlap there. And there has been a definite behavioral uh, change, uh, not only in among children either. Um, Nelson. You wanted to. Uh, so mine is just a very quick one uh, because in in our culture, um, food is about survival, and uh, so today I was just going through Facebook and I saw a shocking picture of a mother burying her child in a shallow grave. Uh, and the child died because of uh, starvation, no food. Um, this, so for me, uh, in some countries, food is not about even culture. It's a matter of survival. And what can we do? And I'm so happy that we are having this kind of conversation. Um, and, you know, draw the reality of what is not, what is happening um, not only here where we are discussing the food culture and thought about food, but what can we do, uh, for example, uh, you know, for people in the world who are facing uh, starvation and, you know, like, what can we do? What kind of thoughts mm -hmm. do we have for a mother, you know, burying her child in a shallow grave because they died for lack of food? Uh, you know, what kind of systems and you know it's good that uh Francis, uh works with the you know world food program um you know you could have some thoughts on on this um i think <clears throat> that's a very appropriate thing to be talking about because i i, I think it ties in with this concept of everyone wanting something cheap because actually how expensive is cheap so we have been having discussions about the use of slave labor to produce a bar of chocolate some of the food that people are buying that is cheap i do not agree that it has good calories it has a health effect it has an effect i know it has a health effect on people what they're being sold. It has an effect on the environment. It has an effect on the movement of people. So, well how expensive the plastic in the world is. So why is Nestle getting away with not only using slave labor to, to, to make chocolate, horrible chocolate bars that everyone's stuffing their faces with. Um, they're also killing all of our wildlife they're killing all of our seas so how expensive is cheap and this really to me is one of the most important questions is that why are these corporations who are killing people killing orangutans killing turtles killing dolphins killing the environment how come they're making so much money and we are all paying the costs this is really what it to me what it boils down to a lot of the conversation that that we're having so food can be used very positively but it can also be used very very negatively i think uh one of the um, the big issues is um uh about information because what i have seen is um 
for instance, Nestle are quite good at um, using information or misinformation, if you like, because every time there is a, a shitstorm, if I may say that, um, they're quite good out there to explain the public that it's not like that and they do this, this and this. And I think as a consumer, we, we like to hear some positive um, information about the things we are buying, the things we are eating. So I think that's the big battle at the moment. It is how can we inform and the school is a, absolutely a good place to start. And I can see through the work I've done that schools are interesting, children are inter interested and young people, um, but still there is a battle to, to have and that's about um, who is winning um, the information, who are right and who are wrong. Just before I pass on the microphone to Wolfgang, um, that also has to do with the media. I mean, that, that, that's of direct interest to me. Um, not so long ago, I went to the University of Minnesota to take part in a seminar, and I was very encouraged by the number of people in the communications faculty at the university, and I commented on this to the dean of the faculty as we were leaving, and he said, oh, yeah, but only one-sixth of them want to become journalists. All the others want to become press officers, yeah. right? <laughs> so that's what you're up against. I'll yeah. pass this on to Bob. Wolfgang, and uh, we'll move on maybe to more prescriptive ways in which these things can be achieved. One thing I just wanted to underline, we were talking about slave labor. Well, I yesterday and Michele today, we were talking about exactly that because that's what the uh, exploitation of the workers in Italy really is. Most of the food made in Italy in the fields is by slave labor. So it's not something that is only far away well, no, I would say slave labor because their living conditions are unhuman. They barely have enough to eat. They can get killed in the van taking them to work. They have to pay the water they drink. So I consider it slave labor because they're getting paid a minimum. I mean, if you were a worthy slave in Rome, they would take care of you. Uh, even in American plantations, if you had certain skills, these are people who are slaves because they're getting paid nothing almost to work in the field. So uh, that's a slave. You know, a slave isn't someone just who gets nothing, he also very little. And the fact is then, it's not something that's a million miles away. It's close, most people know, but they still don't do anything about it. And in part it's maybe because, or certainly also because the economic situation here in Italy uh, is not so good. A lot of people don't have jobs. But I think the fact is we, as journalists, need to put the finger on. We need to shame uh, the supermarkets that are uh, one of the major causes of this. We need to point out that they're guilty just as much or more than the mafia because by driving the prices down, they're the ones that contribute to creating these situations. I don't know. It's just an idea. But uh, I think... I, I mean, again, I think that all of those, you know, I mean, you're journalists and communications people, and I'm a reformed one, so we all think that shining the light is going to change people. But, you know, uh, what about institution to institution? Um, you know, what, I mean, let's deal with the slave labor problem and Cote d'Ivoire. Is World Food Program giving money? To Cote d'Ivoire, I mean, there are levers that are much more powerful than a bunch of pissed off uh, yuppies. Frankly, um, I mean, it's useful, it's helpful. I'm not against it, but you know, obviously, there are systems in Cote d'Ivoire, um, not only uh, corruption but complacency, that is allowing that to go on. So, somebody figuring out how do you actually hurt. The, those who are the enablers, um, and uh, Cote d'Ivoire is probably not that concerned about its brand, though obviously they have that wonderful vacation program. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, you know, seriously, I think institution, institution, ILO, I mean, th there, there is a holding to account or putting pressure on institutional players who can actually put pressure on political actors who are the enablers of this kind of absolutely outrageous i mean i i agree with terry that you know for those of us um you know i i to look at those pictures is to make me feel like i am 
consuming psychic, I'm having psychic injury, my attitude doesn't matter. But if uh, World Food Program says we're not going to fund Cote d'Ivoire, we're going to put institutional pressure on you, then you get some kind of pushback to the kind of power that um, the, that Nestle and others have in those um, uh, circumstances. I mean, it put a pressure on decision makers. But I, I, I find that pretty unlikely because major Western corporations and governments are interested in exploiting Africa and taking everything they can. So why are they going to worry about four kids in a field picking, you know, coca beans if we're just trying to take... I'm, huh? saying, that I'm saying that political actors in Cote d'Ivoire, if their power... If their power and, um, you know, which is partially determined by the amount of aid they get, because those are aid dependent economies, is hurt because aid actors are saying, pardon my language, fuck you until you clean up this act. Um, and that is a, that's a UN mandate, not fuck you, but that is a UN mandate. I mean, there's, there's a, a humanitarian reason why institutions like World Food, Food Program exist. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm feeling like I, I should be answering in the sense that, no, you know, the World Food Programme's mandate doesn't lie around uh, uh, combating slave labour. But the point I really wanted to make was actually, you, I think you do have a, a point about um, uh, grants and uh, the conditions around the way aid is is provided to countries. Um, the World Food Program doesn't give money to Cote d'Ivoire. Okay, we operate in Cote d'Ivoire, um, as in many other countries, and the the money that we come we have comes from our donors, our main donors. But there are uh, certainly, in terms of leverage, there are. Uh, international, multinational organisations who do um, directly finance governments, um, particularly for those longer term projects. Um, and that is an, an area that that's, um, that I think probably you've got a good point that uh, that's ripe for some sort of exploration. Can I add? Uh, yeah, I think I've now been working more than um, almost 15 years in this field as a media person, and it doesn't work. Uh, I make some attention, and people are shocked for a minute or two, and then they are back uh, to the old habits. I think and I hope um, that the guy behind me, uh, the lawyer, can actually do something about it because i think well i hope that legal case a legal case can change this because obviously media can't even though we have been like last week uh, washington post has uh, had a great great article about this issue not new it's just the same but in putin but i don't think it changed anything I might hope that, and I will give you the microphone, uh, Terry, to answer that. Well, money talks, and that, that is our uh, modus operandi, is that I want to get a judgment against Nestle for $2 billion of punitive damages for enslaving people and give that money to programs that are going to help those kids who harvested the cocoa. That's our... That's our end game. If we can do that, then we do win. We change. Then, then the next company, we go to them and say, you can either fix it now or I'm going to sue you for $2 billion and we'll see how that goes for you. So we have, we, but we've been pushed back by every institution you can imagine. The courts hate us. The Congress no longer likes us much because we're, we're stirring up the power structure and it's not something anyone likes to see. Now in Mickey's film, he showed you that he went to the ILO and showed that guy his uh, movie, and the guy was like, oh, that, that's terrible, that's terrible. I've shown my pictures to the ILO, the people who give money to the Cote d'Ivoire programs. I've shown my photos to the U.S. Department of Labor people who are giving money to those programs. For whatever reason, they keep hoping that throwing more money at the same situation is going to change it. And Albert Einstein, I don't know if it's true, but he said something like, doing this over and over and expecting a different result is insanity. And that is what we're facing here is some kind of 
insanity that no one wants to admit that the whole system is corrupt and wrong and that we have to upend it in the ways that we can. One way in which I think consumer attitudes do um, get affected is by labeling, by certification in some form. Now, earlier on in the discussions that we had, you talked about fair trade as being something that does not have an effect uh, in the way that it's expected to have, so that it lowers the price to the producer, but it doesn't in any way police the system that lies behind the production of the foodstuff. What do you do in place of that? Because it has had its effect. So maybe there's some better scheme that we could have. The, the only successful model that I can point to, there, there it started as a program called Roar, which I helped start, and now is called Goodweave, and it's the hand-knotted carpet industry in South Asia. And what they did is they created their own label, and they got they they created an opt-in system. So if you as a carpet producer in those countries wanted to have a credible way of saying you weren't using child labor, that you would get this label and the consumer would trust it because we are an independent entity. We are not self-certifying. We are not government certifying. We are independently certifying. That program is a massive success. It's the only one I can point to. The problem is it's hand-knotted carpets. It's a very small thing in the economy, but we have a written plan that we have presented to the cocoa industry to create that kind of program in the cocoa industry, but the, the companies are not yet ready to do something that radical because no one has made them. We have to either win our case or the consumers have to organize a better boycott, but it could be done. Rick, I have a, I have a question for you, John. Um, what, what does the economist think about um, slave-enabled market efficiencies. <laughs> Am I off the record? The It's quite interesting, actually, that, that I think 2008 made a big difference to a lot of people who have placed a lot of faith in the free market. You know? And definitely a pendulum has swung back to, to greater regulation. Um, the, I think that the, the problem is, as you say, you know, where you insert the pressure that is other than that of the market, because we're not going to see the abandonment of um, capitalism anytime soon. Um, I think that the, I mean, we've always, you know, we've done quite a lot of reports exposing that kind of thing. Whether we've done enough, that is where I would uh, say that, you know, we've got to have an examination of, of, of conscience, not just in The Economist, but in lots of other uh, media. Uh, the, um, and I think that the, the, the whole collapse of or momentary collapse of the global financial system has really not had the effects that a lot of people thought it would have at the time i mean a real going back over everything to say how could this possibly have happened that we get to a point where the u.s treasury security does not know from one day to the next whether Wall Street's going to survive, you know, because the whole system has become so complicated. And I think that also comes through, you know, in the documentary, there's a moment where, talking of complexity, there's a moment where you go through the process of the selling of the beans and then the, 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 the thing. It's, it's a complex process. And, and everybody at every stage can disown the previous bit of that stage and say, it's nothing to do with me. And I think that that's something that we really need to give a lot of thought to. And the actors who can bring the real pressure to bear um, ought to be thinking about that. Wolfgang. 
simply said, for example, if you make clothing, whether you make it, if you sell clothing, whether you make it or not, you're responsible. Same way if you sell coca, whether you make it or not, you're responsible. I mean, that sort of thing has to be, I think, clarified and, and maybe insisted upon more. That That's an issue. But then again, that's part of what I was saying, shaming these companies and also creating damage for them, whether through a boycott or through a lawsuit. Because if you hurt them in the pocket, then they, they'll listen. And that's exactly what, when I was saying about more prescriptive ways in which these things can be done, I think that the conclusion here is that boycotts maybe work in some cases, but not greatly. Labeling can have an effect and is maybe not being deployed sufficiently effectively. Um, publicity maybe is the first stage towards getting some action done, but it's not an end in itself. And that the point that Rick's been making repeatedly, which is that you have to have some insertion of pressure by an actor who can bring pressure there, is actually going to be the only effective way. In other words, you know, I mean, Terry mentioned taking them for $2 billion as being a pretty effective way to get uh, behavior changed. Charles? Um, I think that also, I think all of these comments are, you know, very apposite and, and um, this issue with the child slave labor does lead us into the other element of the discussions that we've been having here, which is about immigration. So if we create situations in countries, whether they're Italy, um, with you know forced labor or underpaid labor, or whether it's in 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 uh, exactly or on the Ivory Coast producing cheap chocolate. If you detach people from their identities and their traditional culture and you put in plantations where you've got monoculture spraying, the necessity for the use of cheap or slave labor, um, you've got agro-mafia policies with the destruction of an environment, those places are no longer places where cultures and we've had a wonderful talk for Camille about her cultural identity, where cultures can be sustainable, where people can be sustainable. What do they do? What have they? What choice have they got to become a slave or leave their country? So when we we look at these issues and we talk about how to change it, I think it's very important to realise that the minute you create a dislocation and a disconnect with where your food comes from, what you are actually eating, and we do know that it's wonderful when you really know that something comes from the earth and comes from a relationship that has been built up for thousands of years with your environment that you know you protect your environment because it sustains your family, it sustains your culture, it means that from year to year you can live and be with your people. Now what we've got are systems that are dislocating people, literally dislocation. And these are the real problems that we're facing. So everyone gets upset when we get immigration and everyone starts coming to our country when we've completely destroyed their own. So, you know, we are not, that is why. What are we eating? We're actually eating dead orangutans. We're eating dead children in, from the Ivory Coast. We're eating prostitution. So we are eating, what we think we are eating is not actually food anymore. We do have some optimism in this. <laughs> um, and we're going to get, I think, more of it tomorrow. And this is where I'd like to actually um, kind of actually picking up on what Charlotte's just said about culture and food and people and dislocation, um, give you a sneak preview of tomorrow's discussions um, by giving you an example of where climate change has had a positive outcome. And Nelson will very quickly explain to us what has happened in his own country and with his own people as a result of melting of the snows on Kilimanjaro, right? We'll be talking about that in the morning.
yeah. Yes, yeah. indeed. Just very quickly, uh, a <coughs> something nice to say to wrap up on. It. Yeah, uh, so, um, so just to wrap up, um, so our people, the Maasai, have been concerned about the evolving issues around climate change. And they decided that um, they will not wait for someone else to provide the leadership. So just uh, about a month ago, we had a meeting uh, where the different clans gathered under a tent uh, in the shadows of Mount Kilimanjaro in a barren piece of land where in the past there used to be trees, there used to be grass, and the wind was silent, but now it was all dust everywhere. And the Maasai decided that they need to do something to regenerate their own land, to you know, restore livelihoods, to restore the nature. And uh, so they came up with the White Mountain Initiative with a bigger aim of actually restoring back the ice caps in Kilimanjaro because it is all boiling down into climate change. And uh, so the local people decided that the solution is within their hands. And hence the White Mountain Initiative, which we'll talk more about tomorrow. <laughs> You're all going to have to wait for that. Anyway, thank you very much indeed for the wonderful, lively discussion. Shall we see if Alexander has a question? Mm. Alexander, do you have a question? Um, yes, um, I'm a huge um, chocolate consumer, so I'm very dismayed to hear. Hello, Alexander. Can you hear me? Do you hear me all right? I can. Do you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Wonderful. Um, but you're, so yes. you're a bit crackly. You're a bit crackly. I think we've got a bit of a bad line. Okay, well, perhaps it's easier if I write. Yeah, no, it's breaking up. I think we've got bandwidth problems. Okay, um, let me see where I can cross anyway. Um, I'm a huge um, chocolate Hello. fan, and um, obviously, it's made to see how much um, chocolate comes from slave labor. Um, I know that in the Netherlands, there is a company called um, Tony's Chocolate Only. Um, um, in is this. Um, Alexander, we can't really hear you very well. Okay, but perhaps I'll write my question. Sorry, but thank you. you thank you for that question we didn't hear. <laughs> <laughs> but, we, but we salute and wave to you, nevertheless. Thank you. <laughs> hey, bye, Alex. I'm sorry, you were really cracky then. We didn't hear a word of it. Yeah, you're chewing gum. I noticed it's very scruffy. And what's that beard? You need a shave. <laughs> hey, Alexander, lots of love. Actually, try speaking now, see if we can hear you. Sorry, Vaughan. Um, apologies for the No, it's still crackly. No, I wonder what it is. Okay, he's texted us. Our company is like Tony's chocolate on helping the cause. We've got a question. We've got a question. You can't go. We have a question and you have to answer. Alexander demands an answer. What's the question? Alexander demands an answer. He's asked a question online. Oh, he's got you now. Oh. Has he taken his shoes like out? Chocolate Tony helping the cause. I have an answer for that. Aha. Uh -huh. There we go. Terry, Terry has an answer. <laughs> Thank you. T um, Tony, I, I have been in a debate for the last four or five months with uh, Tony Chocolatoni, which is a small producer and they are operating in Cote d'Ivoire. 
they have one thing they have done is they've identified and clearly uh, revealed who their uh, sources are in the plantations. That is true. But, and they're paying their producers more than everybody else. The problem is what I was discussing earlier with the fair trade problem is they do not verify that their producers are not using child labor. What they say is we only use producers that we know and trust Therefore, they must not be using child labor, which is simply not an, uh, an acceptable form of verification. I've told them that repeatedly. Uh, I've said we are dying to endorse somebody if there's one company that we could say is doing the right thing. So we're still in discussions with them because I would love to be able to say, please buy Tony Chocolate Tony or some other company. But right now, I, I would not say that because they are not verifying independently that the people that they are producing with are not using child labor. And you might have a to add to that. No, I've just got a, I've got a suggestion. Why don't we get the executive of uh, VW, uh, Volkswagen, to do the uh, monitoring and ascertain whether... Self-monitoring. <laughs> um, I was just thinking that, you know, this has been going on for some time. These uh, children were between 12 and 14, 15 years of age until they get big enough to say, screw you, I'm out of here. Um, what is happening to the voices of those people? I know you mentioned or you mentioned that they were sort of scared and they might not have gone back to their home countries and they might be sort of in the outer suburbs of, you know, Wagadugu or they might be in, in Cote d'Ivoire and other places. What about their voices? What about hearing from somebody who, who tells, I was one of those kids, I got on the truck, this is what I thought, and this is where I am now. I don't, couldn't think of anything more powerful than that. I can think of one more powerful thing. I mean, I thought in your film, that first young girl who was worried about what would happen when she went home because she was dispatched to make money for her family. So if there was an aid program from some aid actor that said, okay, we can provide viable, competitive, economic alternatives to those child laborers, we can, you know, they... Um, if if we if you can beat if you can beat the uh, slave traders um, with a better offer, um, that might be. Well, you probably aren't paying them anything like the film. So. Yeah. It wouldn't even take that much. Yeah. I mean, there's one that sort of touches a little bit with one area that I mentioned this morning, which is school meals, and I mean. Keeping kids in school, uh, having the family know that if their child goes to 80%, you know, has an 80% attendance rate, that they get a 50 kg bag of, of sorghum or wheat or whatever, that makes a huge difference. Now, we tend to think it's interesting because we, I mean, it's where I work and, you know, the, the thinking of that often tends to be focused on the benefits for girls because you have, you're keeping girls in school, they are less likely to get married young, they're less likely to have children young, um, it be in situations of abuse, being, having children very, very young with all sorts of associated difficulties. But, you know, here we're talking about boys, essentially. Um, and we do also, the, the World Food Programme is involved in, in providing take-home rations as incentives also for boys as well. Um, and that's, it's, it's one piece. You're right that a bigger solution is, is required. Let's find some alternatives so that these children don't have to jump on trucks and go to other countries or have expectations. Yeah. Yeah. The kids, they'd probably have to pay someone to go there and then do the work. Yeah. Just one final note, at least from my perspective, is that.
your suggestion about talking to the kids who returned. For a while, they were terrified of doing so because they feared retribution. In our lawsuits, we called the children John Doe 1, John Doe 2 to protect their names. But the original group of trafficked children uh, is, have now been more willing to talk. And in Mickey's next film that he's doing, The War on Chocolate, we interview the recently uh, returned trafficked children who will be telling their stories about what it was like. And of course, you know, the ideal story is, you know, have any of these children ever um, uh, ended up beyond you know, the, the countries where either they came from or Cote d'Ivoire? Have any of those children ever sought to emigrate? Has any of them ever got on a boat to Europe? Uh, no. Uh, the, the people that I represent, they all have returned to Mali, and uh, they are now just farmers like most other people, young men of their age, uh, but they're reunited with their families. Okay, thank you very much indeed. I think we've entered on a...